speaking to you about activism. Um, it's entitled the Chicano Movement and Political Activism. But um, as somebody who's a historian myself, Andres Tijerina, para servirle, professor of Austin Community College, I look around the room and, uh, and I see the people that we're writing about. I see the people that we're talking about. Um, Vilma Martinez, um, Al Kaufman. Um, I see the people in the room who are testifying right now. Uh, Dr. Angela Valenzuela. And uh, people who are right now working in the Chicano, in the Latino community for exactly what we're talking about in the minority community, African American, minority communities. You've done it, and uh, you're still doing it. Um, I'm talking to a student from my own college, Austin Community College, and she is one of the people who's actively involved in exactly what we're writing about and talking about. So um, preaching to the choir is, is almost a misnomer in this group. Uh, you're not only the choir, um, you're the preachers. <laughs> and it's an honor to be before you. But at the same time, you came from scholarship. You came from the studies. You come from the research. And everything that you've accomplished is because when we fight the court cases, when we present our arguments and when we, present, when we protest, we use documentation. The Latino, the Mexicano, has never done anything but constructive protest. Has never done anything but work in this country. And so what we have today is scholarly. But they are also just an example of the role that the scholars, that you yourselves, when you were scholars, have played. So today, we will hear from scholars. And we will then hopefully get input from you in question and answer. We'll allow a few minutes for question and answer so that all of us can put our heads together because the issues that we're talking about are ongoing. We're going to be talking about um, student protests for better curriculum. But right now, Dr. Valenzuela, I myself am, am an expert witness from Maldef in another court case, and we need this information. We need to hear what are the major issues, what's the documentation that we can use today in the Maldef cases that you can use. And so let us go ahead and listen to the scholars, but con el pretexto, with a pretext of what we're going to do is that we're going to get input from you all also so that we can all as a group uh, try to formulate a way to keep the movement going and, and uh, keep the direction. Our first speaker today is an assistant professor of history at the University of Texas Pan American. Oh, Rio Grande Valley, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, that was an old one. She's now a vaquero. <laughs> Vaque <laughs> vaquera. Is that what, are they vaqueras? There's vaqueras. Okay. <laughs> and, I, and I tease about that because there were vaqueras. You were here in Texas when they when they took that uh, that name. It was a big issue. Yeah. And um, I I know I, I can do nothing but congratulate the vaqueras for taking that taking that as their mascot. Originally from uh, from Tucson, this paper is part of um, her dissertation which is, she's now reformulating, as we all probably have done, into a manuscript for publication, Closing the Breach, Mexican-American Activism and the Education Reform Movement, 1950 to 1990. And so when it comes out, Maritza wants every one of you to buy two copies of her book. Oh, I did not say that. <laughs> Today she'll be speaking on, we are asking for equal education, school desegregation cases, Mexican-American educational activism as political engagement. Maritza. Thank you, Andres. <clears throat> Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Buenas tardes. Um, 
As uh, Dr. Tijerina mentioned, <clears throat> uh, this paper is a, an excerpt out of a larger chapter that's out of the, the book or the manuscript that will be uh, looking at Mexican-American activism in terms of how many, <clears throat> in terms of their, within the, co within the context of legal, um, legal cases filed to um, not only promote educational reform, uh, but really to dismantle um, the segregation that occurred throughout the Southwest. We tend not to think about segregation affecting Mexican-American students, but it did. And um, the Southwest, throughout the Southwest, there were what became known as Mexican schools that were physically segregated and that were actually constructed separately to educate the children of Mexicano immigrants, mostly, um, in, in most cases in uh, California, Texas, uh, not New Mexico so much, Colorado, and in some cases Arizona, but in Arizona there's not as many so-called Mexican schools. What, what I found is the type of segregation that not only existed, but that parents challenged and that Chicano students challenged during the walkouts was the quality of education that Tucson Public Schools was meeting out to Chicano students. And in that sense, it's not necessarily physical segregation, it's academic and or intellectual segregation. Um, so this, this paper is uh, just a small excerpt on, on the lawsuit that was filed in 1974. It's called Mendoza versus Tucson School District Number 1, um, and it was part of a, a second lawsuit that was filed by African American parents alleging uh, some of the same conditions in the schools. So on October 11, 1974, Maria Mendoza, Teresa Trujillo, Alberto Sanchez, and other Mexican-American parents filed a class action lawsuit against Tucson School District No. 1 through their attorneys, Michael Osavala and Morris Baller, with the financial support and assistance of the Mexican-American Defense, Legal Defense and Education Fund, MALDEF. Mendoza followed a similar lawsuit filed by attorney Ruben Salter on behalf of Roy and Joyce, Josie Fisher and other black parents who support, with the support of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and or the NAACP. Both Mendoza and Fisher charged the district with de jure segregation of Mexican American and black students providing and providing them with an inferior education. On May 5th, U.S. District Court Judge William C. Frey consolidated the cases for purposes of trial, and on June 5th, he issued his ruling. In general, the, the court did not find de jure segregation, meaning they did not find legal segregation, because they did not, the judge did not necessarily find that um, Tucson school district officials <clears throat> intended to segregate students into separate schools. That was his find based on his evidence. But MALDEF uh, does do an, an exhaustive investigation and they do support some of the findings that even the federal government um, under the investigation of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission also found. But <clears throat> Just to uh, give some a little uh, a little bit of background, so for several years, Mexican American parents complained that the schools were not adequately educating minority children. In a letter to parents, plaintiff Maria Mendoza claimed, um, "quote The proof ex expressed itself by the annual reading test scores, which showed that minority children were scoring several grades below uh, several grades below grade level." Mendoza further indicated that she had exhausted all channels from the bottom up to the, to the top, trying to seek relief for the children with no results. Mendoza's letter captured the frustration of many Mexican-American parents who felt, um, who felt frustrated when they learned their children could not read or were not reading at grade level. 
The story of Mendoza highlights what education scholars Guadalupe San Miguel Jr. and Richard Valencia call edu the educational plight and struggle of Mexican Americans in the Southwest as they continued to experience school segregation and other inequities even after Brown versus Board of Education ended de jure seg segregation in 1954. So <clears throat> Brown versus Board of Education was just one of, um, was one lawsuit that had been filed in a series of lawsuit up to, that led up to 1954. As early as 1925, Mexican-American parents in Arizona, California, and Texas successfully challenged school segregation in court cases such as Romo v. Laird, 1925, Alvarez v. Lemon Grove School Board, 1930, <clears throat> uh, Independent School Districts v. Salvatierra, 1930, and in 1946, the case of Mendez v. Westminster abolished segregation of Mexican students in Southern California. That paved the way for Delgado versus Bastrop Independent School District, 1948, and Gonzalez versus Chile in Tolleson, Arizona, in 1952. All of these cases basically paved the way um, for Brown versus Board of Education because, in many instances, uh, for example, in Mendez, some of the legal strategies that were used in Mendez versus Westminster were also used by attorneys in Brown versus Board of Education. In addition, some of those, uh, some of the same people, were uh, were involved in Mendez and Board. So, for example, um, Governor Earl Warren was the governor of well, Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren was a governor in California when Mendez was filed. He um, <clears throat> Thurgood Marshall filed an amicus brief brief in Mendez supporting the dismantling of de jure segregation. And then George I. Sanchez was a tes testified in the Mendez versus Westminster, testifying that uh, social science research had, all, had, had proved or shown that segregation was psychologically harmful to children. And therefore, if you really wanted to socialize children uh, together and have them so-called, you know, to learn English, they should be together. They should be socialized together because children, you know, play together on the playground and, and uh, other socialization. <clears throat> Academic segregation and differential treatment of Mexican origin students was also prevalent in Mexican schools. Students in these schools had different curricula focused on learning English and vocational skills, inferior facilities, teaching materials, and inadequately trained teachers. They also faced the no Spanish rule that forbade them from speaking Spanish in the classroom and on the school grounds, tracking into low ability programs, culturally insensitive bias IQ testing, and a dearth of bilingual education programs and services. So most of these complaints were the complaints that the parents cited in their lawsuit in 1974, um, which was 20 years after Brown versus Board of Education um, is filed. So my question was, why 20 years later do Mexican American parents in Tucson filed a desegregation lawsuit? And which, for me, that was a big question because um, I had, in my mind, segregation was abolished. Segregation was, was no longer an issue or a problem. But what, I, what I'm finding, what I found was that it's, it's the academic segregation that these parents were actually challenging. And I think that is relatively new in terms of, um, well, maybe not new, but it's an interesting point in terms of legal challenges um, to promote equity in the schools. Um, Mendoza versus Tucson uh, School District number one is relatively unknown. It is recently receiving increased attention mostly because of its connections to the dismantle, um, this, the dismantling of ethnic studies in Arizona under SB 2281. And so Mendoza versus uh, Tucson Public School District forced the federal government to um, in, impose a federal oversight until it reached unitary status, meaning that it's still, it's still under federal oversight. And so the ethnic studies program at Tucson High School 
um, was a product of Mendoza. Yet there, not, there is now a law that says you cannot teach Mexican American history, ethnic studies, Native American studies. You cannot teach any of these things in public schooling, um, which is uh, which is still under under uh, legal. It's under legal scrutiny at this time. So this article describes the circumstances that led to Mendoza by examining the grassroots activities that Mexican American parents, teachers, students, and community leaders engaged in challenge, um, challenging the policies and practices they viewed as discriminatory and resulted in an inferior education. So this case is, takes place within the context of the, the Chicano movement. Um, because by 1968, uh, we have a watershed, and we have a few watersheds. Uh, we have the Bilingual Education Act that's passed in 1968. We have the Chicano Movement student walkouts that occurred from 68 to 70, um, and that the, at, at, the, at that height, um, the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights, the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, has conducted or began its investigation of public schools in the Southwest. So they began their, their investigation in 68, 1969, and that continued through 1974. <clears throat> Tucson, like other areas in the Southwest also um, also experienced uh, student walkouts, and it's the students that um, really saw the lack of uh, the lack of academic preparation in their high schools. In 1968, um, the minority students comprised more than 60 percent of the student population at two um, major high schools in, in in Tucson, Tucson High School and Pueblo High Schools. The majority of the teachers, coaches, administrators, however, were white. Chicano and black students were very much aware of the inequalities that existed at both schools and expressed their dissatisfaction in various ways. And the, <clears throat> one of the ways they expressed this dissatisfaction was by um, creating a coalition and organizing walkouts, walkouts between 1968 and 1969. Um, and they cite the um, the, the Eurocentric curriculum that not only neglected their language and heritage, but also the role that Mexican Americans had had in the development of the, United, uh, of the U.S., especially in the Southwest. They noted low educational attainment. They were very much aware of the high school dropout rate at that time, 60 percent um, Chicano students were dropping out. So they were very much aware of not only their educational conditions, but also the conditions and the um, socioeconomic status of the Mexican population in Tucson. In fact, um, um, some studies had, um, and some of the studies that, that MALDEF looked at and MALDEF commissioned during its investigation was to call certain um, educational experts at that time. And so one of those experts is Thomas P. Carter, who writes about the educational neglect of, of Mexican Americans in the Southwest. And this is what he said in his testimony uh, during, during the investigation. More often, schools reflect and reinforce the beliefs of the more traditional conservative elements within a given community. The school recreates the present social situation by establishing school-related conditions of isolation and subordination that perpetuate the social system. So he's connecting the school system to, um, to socioeconomic status. And Chicano students at that time uh, we're very much aware of that. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead to um, to about 1969 when Mendoza, um, when Maria Mendoza and um, Teresa Trujillo were were mothers, and they 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 met each other because they both had complaints about the the level of education or the quality of of education that their that their children had had received they also met 
the other uh, plaintiff on the uh, on the case, Alberto Sanchez, who also noticed um, that the e educational opportunities for Chicano students were were very much um, provided in a segregated environment. This is what Sanchez says. The kids at Manzo have been denied equal educational opportunity because it's a segregated school. So for Sanchez, segregated school were detrimental to his children. Gloria, Gloria Limon, another parent, complained about the way that she and other Mexican-American parents were treated by teachers and the problems they observed as volunteers in their schools. Um, they noted outdated textbooks, materials, poor desks, facilities, poor curricula, culturally insensitive, and unqualified teachers. So this is what the parents are noting. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead to when they file, um, uh, why they file the, the lawsuit. <clears throat> they continuously have communications with the superintendent who who over and over again not only neglected the parents and the community's concerns, but outright denied that the school district or any of his schools were discriminating against Mexican-American students. This, however, in light of two studies, one conducted by the U.S. Department of Health and Education, Health, Education and Welfare, the HEW office, and the office, the U.S. Office of the U.S. Commission of Civ on Civil Rights, or the OCR, they conducted their own studies between 1968 and 1974. Those two studies found the exact same results. They found that Mexican-American students were being discriminated against based on language, that they were disproportionately found in, at that time, they were called EMR classes, or emotion, for emotional and mental retardation. Um, those terms are no longer used. Um, and that the, that the district was failing um, not only Mexican-American students, but um, black students, Native American students, and other minority students in the school district. Um, <clears throat> at that time, um, just to give you an idea as to what the Office of Civil Rights says, uh, John Palomino was the investigator um, in Tucson, and he op op opined or gave his opinion that low scores amongst Mexican-American students were directly linked to language barriers that could be remedi remedied through bilingual programs. However, the, stu the school district did not have um, the bilingual programs that it needed. He also noted that Mexican-American students were placed in low ability courses, which were not, um, at the same time, were not adequate indicators of low intellectual ability. So the conventional wisdom was that Mexican-American students were intellectually inferior and therefore would not benefit from the same, um, the same curriculum or academically rigorous curriculums that were predominantly um, in, in, Anglo, in predominantly Anglo schools. Um, so by, 19, by 1974, both reports issued their indictments against the, the school district, and they required or asked the school district to either desegregate in some way and promote pro and, and create programs that would improve the quality of education for, um, for Mexican-American students. Um, Mexican American parents were not satisfied with the with the the results of um, of uh, of both reports, and so they decided that they were going to have to take matters into their own hands. So in in February 1974, they created an organization called Mexican Americans for Equal Education, um, and it was an association of various parents throughout Tucson, including the three plaintiffs, Mendoza, Trujillo, and Sanchez. Um, another member of that organization or that parent organization is now uh, Congressman Raul Grijalva. And so he was one of the parents that also complained uh, about the schools. 
in 1974, the parents said we're going to have to take the we're going to have to take matters into our own into our own hands. And so with the help of a local attorney, Michael Zavala, they contacted Maldef and they filed their own lawsuit. They filed the lawsuit in uh, Mendoza versus uh, Tucson School District. The lawsuit charged um, the district with creating and maintaining a tri-ethnic segregated school system tracking students in a discriminatory manner, providing in in inferior curricula and facilities to minority students, and discriminating against Mexican Americans uh, in various aspects. <clears throat> so by 19, um, throughout, throughout, the, um, uh, throughout 1974, Maldif conducts its own investigation and the results that it finds corroborated what the HEW and the U.S. Commission uh, of Civil Rights found. And so they did, in their view, they did find that, that the school district intentionally segregated students through attendance uh, gerrymandering of attendance boundaries, through um, assigning students uh, Mexican-American students and black students in one school creating Mexican uh, minority schools um, and so when the judge was reviewing that evidence he did look at the the, the case that had been decided um, four years earlier in, in Keys versus uh, the school district number one so the, the judge was very much aware that these uh, patterns created segregated schools um, and so despite the fact that he, um, he was aware of, of these patterns, ultimately his ruling in 1974 um, did not find um, that the school district had promoted and maintained de jure segregation. So it was mostly de facto segregation. And, and so that's what the lawsuit had, had challenged and had, was filed um, uh, to, to dismantle. Um, so what Mexican-American parents did not get was they did not get the judge to look at the quality of education that was being, um, that, that was, uh, that Mexican-American students received in, in the public schools. So ultimately, the parents were not necessarily happy with Judge Frey's outcome. Um, he does not find de jure segregation throughout the district. However, he did find several schools, about 30 schools that were ethnically imbalanced. And so because of that, he does issue a desegregation order. And he tells the district, find ways, do something to promote a more ethnically imbalanced schools. However, that does not address and did not address what the <coughs> Mexican-American parents wanted. They wanted this, the judge to, to look into and to rule on the quality of education, the curriculum, the policies, the pedagogical methods used to teach Mexican-American students, their children. Um, but, but he did not address those issues at all. And so in the end, the the ruling that uh, that Judge Frey um, that Judge Frey uh, uh, issued uh, elicited enormous protests from the Mexican American community there, and they wrote letters and they were just very dissatisfied with with the overall ruling. So that is going to um, I'm going to stop there, and um, and let you all um, who will just. Go to the next ones. <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Marisa. And you know, <clears throat> while I'm talking about the distinguished people that we have in this audience today, and of course the distinguished scholars, what's amazing is that all of us work for the parents. That uh, we have all of the scholarship, we have all of the documentation, all the research, and everything like that. But the people who start it all, the people who drive it all. And the people who will confront the judges are the parents. They don't have libraries. They don't have research. And they don't have the high pollutant names and titles that the rest of us do. But it's the parents. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think that's what I see is the, is the activism is not, not students in college, not us professionals, but the parents who are, 
who will confront a judge and talk to the judge about curriculum, talk to the judge about validity of education uh, that really stands out in, in these valid cases you're talking about. Thanks, Marisa. You're welcome. Tucson cases. James Barrera is a, uh, an associate professor of history in the South Texas College. He's a native of McAllen, Texas, uh, down in the Texas Rio Grande Valley. He received his PhD in history at the University of New Mexico, and he's the author of five scholarly articles, and he's an author who specializes in 1960s Chicano movement. Um, he has become and is becoming an authority in this field, and we want to see certainly much more uh, publications coming from you, James. Uh, his topic today is We Want Better Education, the 1960 Chicano Student Movement for Educational Reform and Political Empowerment in South Texas. James. <clears throat> All right, I would uh, prefer to stand and uh, just to stretch a bit. <laughs> and uh, as I know, I'm feeling a bit uh, restless if I sit down or remain seated. But I just want to say a thankful to Professor Maggie Rivas Rodriguez and the, uh, the Latino, the Voting Rights Act, Political Engagement Conference opportunity to, to be here and to present my uh, research and to discuss uh, my experience in, uh, in the time that I've been doing this work. And I want to draw a map. And this will be a rough sketch just to give you all a better idea of what I'm talking about. <coughs> uh, map of South Texas. And please forgive me, I'm not an artist, so I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Tortilla. <laughs> yeah, tortillas come out in the shape of Texas, don't they? Sometimes they do. Depends on how long you've been making them. But you don't tell your wife that. I, I don't, I just, oh, beautiful. <laughs> you got awesome handwriting. I've got to compliment you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's got to have been an elementary school teacher at some point. <laughs> right. My penmanship. to, uh, like I said, just to show you on this rough sketch, rough drawing here of the locations, uh, case studies uh, where I have uh, done research, uh, Westside San Antonio, Lanier and Edgewood High Schools, Kingsville, at Gillette Junior High, Ed Calchelsa High School, and as uh, you all may have heard, the famous one at Crystal City. And they did occur within a year of each other, 68 began in uh, Westside San Antonio in uh, spring of 68. Then you have November 68 at Calchelsa. In April of uh, 69 is when you have the Kingsville to Junior High protests and then the uh, Crystal City walkout of December of 69. And as I'm sure you all are, of course, aware that it was in the late 60s when you have the ongoing civil rights movement, anti-war movement, <clears throat> that uh, reflected the larger societal and political forces of the 1960s, which uh, 
provided the impetus, uh, the impetus for the rise of the Chicano student movement, specifically oriented to change in the American educational system. And uh, uh, the first major student walkout, and y'all know what that is, right? A walkout is an actual protest where students, they plan ahead of time to deliberately, you know, in the morning after first period began, they would get up from their desk and they would literally walk out and they would protest, they would participate in a picket sign or strike right in front of the school. And that's what occurred in these uh, uh, sites throughout South Texas. But the first, uh, as far as uh, in history, U.S. history, the first major Chicano Mexican-American student walkout occurred in East Los Angeles, which, uh, as you can imagine, is a very urban area, and so was West Side San Antonio, but then the others, Kingsville, Ed Couch, Elsa, Crystal City, they were more rural uh, farming communities. Even to this day, they're still very much rural, uh, small uh, communities, and uh, really haven't been that well developed or urbanized. But of course, San Antonio has obviously grown very substantially, especially with urban development. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first major Chicano student walkout occurred in the west side of San Antonio. And it was in that year, 68, when there was a civil rights hearing, a 1968 civil rights committee hearing, where you have uh, Dr. Hector Garcia and others of the U.S. Civil Rights Committee that questioned students at Lanier High School. And there was one student, uh, Jose Vasquez, that was asked during this hearing, uh, what do you think about the curriculum in the San Antonio school system? Are you satisfied? with the curriculum of the San Antonio school system. And Lanier High School student Jose Vasquez replied, no, I don't think so. <clears throat> and that he also, um, Jose Vasquez also went on to say that I'm giving the impression that Texas history that is being shown to me is that the Texas history of the Anglo here in Texas, not the Texas history of the Mexican American or Mexicano. It is to show that Anglo is, the Anglo is superior and so it just gives you a, a glimpse into one of the motivations for students to walk out. But other, uh, other demands for educational reform include uh, that Chicano students be allowed to select their own candidates for student council and extracurricular activities. And that, as a matter of fact, that's what led to the Crystal City walkout because in the Crystal City, uh, before the protest began, uh, there was only one Mexican-American cheerleader, mm -hmm. while there were three, I believe, Anglo cheerleaders. And so there was uh, Dana Palacios, who was a cheerleader, and there was also student leader, Severita Lara, that, uh, you know, that urged the school system to change that kind of policy regarding the method of selecting cheerleaders. And so that was, like I said, one of the uh, main reasons that led to the protest of the schools, not just Crystal City, but in these other uh, places as well. Uh, other important concern was that students have access to effective counseling resources because throughout this time period in the 60s, so there were students that were told that, uh, you know, that they would, not qualified for college. <coughs> mm -hmm. And I remember that occurred when I was doing my research. That did occur in these schools. And I know I interviewed some former students, and there was one former student in Ed Couchelsa that told me uh, his name was Freddie Sines. When he asked about going to college, he was told by the counselor, Why do you want to go to college? You got to. You got a big, strong arm. You're good for the army, right? And that was, of course, mm -hmm. what had uh, really uh, caused concern on the part of male students because it was a time of the Vietnam War, and that they mm -hmm. 
you know, they wanted to try and explore, explore the possibility of going to college, not just having to, to think that their destiny was in the military uh, after finishing high school. And uh, in the case of Ed Calcelso, there were female students, like I've interviewed Marta Virial, and uh, she was one of the student leaders, uh, student leaders that had told me when I interviewed her a few years ago, uh, she told me that, uh, that Mexican American students would, when they were in typing class, they would use run down old typewriters while they were Anglo students that used newer typewriters. And uh, Ubaldo Vasquez, another student <coughs> at Ed Calcelsa, he was the one that remembers at one time he was on the school playground and he was telling a friend in Spanish, dame la pelota. And the PE coach heard that, Kenneth Costick, and Kenneth Costick reprimanded him and said, hey, you don't speak Spanish here. This is cool, you speak English, English only. You know, and, and what you gotta understand about many of the students, Mexican American students at this time period in the 60s was that their first language was Spanish, right? I mean, they often spoke Spanish in the home and of course, English was a second language. They were just, you know, learning more of the English language and as far as mastery and fluency. And so it was, on, you know, of course, not always easy for them to speak, you know, English all the time at school and then go home and then speak Spanish all the time. You know, that's uh, one of the, uh, you know, the, the circumstances that they faced, right, was having to make sure that, that they, you know, were, were fully uh, fluent in both languages, but it wasn't always, like I said, always simple, right? Just to speak only Spanish at home and to speak only English in school. And uh, there were students that were spanked uh, for speaking Spanish in the school. Uh, principal Marvin Pipkin, the principal at Echel Chelsea, he would spank students that were sent to the office for speaking Spanish, and that did occur in these other schools <coughs> and even throughout the Southwest. Uh, Maricela Rodriguez, uh, she was a former student, another one at, at Calchelsa, and she remembers that, that when she was going to school, the counselor would tell the Mexican-American female students that you got to uh, make sure that your dress is appropriate length at the knee, but then she also observed that, wait a minute, there are Anglo students that have shorter skirts, but they're allowed to go to school. They don't have to go back home and change their dress. You know, so there was diff the differential treatment um, as far as uh, a school rule on the dress code. Uh, at Lanier High School, uh, there was a, a student council meeting, and this was in April of 1968, where uh, you have a small group of students that met with, with uh, uh, she was a student, it was a female, I don't know the name, but uh, I'm still researching that, finding out her identity, but it was a female who was the sponsor of the student council, and there was a meeting at Lanier High School and that one of the former students at the time was, uh, was Homer Garcia. I don't know if you all heard of him, Homer Garcia. He's now a current professor at Texas Southern University in Houston. And he was one of the ones that was vocal about wanting to promote educational reform at the near high school. And he questioned that, you know, why do students have to be tracked into vocational courses? Why can't we take college, you know, college prep courses or honors courses? And, you know, there was also another student, a female student named uh, Elida Aguilar that also spoke up about that, that issue. And I do have it documented because, uh, like I said, I know that uh, Homer Garcia had told me this in his interview that, that the sponsor of the student council basically told the students to shut up. You know, what are you talking about? Uh, change the curriculum and about wanting uh, 
classes that prepare you for college, you know, that the, the student, the, the student uh, council representative that were there, you know, there were student council representatives and student leaders that got up and walked out. Now, there wasn't a, a, a school-wide walkout like there was in the other areas, the other schools, but, but there was also Edgar Lozano that was an important student leader who also encouraged the near high school to change his policy about the vocational training to allow more students to have access to, uh, to, course, you know, to courses that would better prepare students for college. And in the San Antonio School District, uh, one statistical study, one statistical study of nine San Antonio area school systems uh, that I've done in my research, that I've uncovered in my research, the Edgewood, because there was also the protest at Edgewood, Edgewood High School. In the Edgewood School District, the district spent a total of $356 per student and had a Mexican-American student enrollment of near 90%. Uh, another part of the city of San Antonio, Alamo Heights ISD, they spent $594, exactly $238 more than Edgewood School District's total amount per student. So you know, that was another deficiency that, that the Chicano students questioned in the west side of San Antonio about the amount of funding allocated per student. And in my interviews with the uh, former students, uh, Richard at the Edgewood High School, uh, former students at Edgewood High School, Richard Herrera and Diana Briseño, they remember using old textbooks uh, they recall seeing other students standing against the cafeteria wall, waiting for a place to sit, looking out of broken windows in the school, uh, hearing other students complain about the lack of college preparatory classes, wanting more advanced math, advanced science, and uh, instead that they, uh, for the most part, were not allowed to enroll in more advanced coursework, to, to gain more better preparation for college. And so that was one of the, like I said, major reasons why you had the protests. And of course, the Mexican American Youth Organization that was formed in 1967, and I believe one of the founders is here at this conference, Jose Angel Gutierrez, and four others that founded the Mexican American Youth Organization, which is a Chicano student organization based in San Antonio, but it did have chapters throughout the South Texas area, even in the, in the Deep South, near Red Cow Chelsea. And they would often meet with the students in their homes, the student leaders' homes, and they would talk about these issues. And it was the Mexican American Youth Organization that encourages students to approach your principals to do something, to, to let them know your concern, let, let them know what's on your mind. Don't stay silent. And throughout the course of my research, I found out that the principals of the schools were reluctant to meet uh, with the students or they were reluctant to, to uh, implement the demands of the students. And so the students, they would work together with the Mexican American Youth Organization to plan the walkout. And they made picket signs. You know, they had uh, planned this weeks ahead of time before the actual walkout. And in my study at Cal Chelsea, there was a very important court case where you have, and this is on November of 1968, you had five expelled students because there were students that were expelled at uh, Ed Cal Chelsea for their involvement. And it was uh, a case that was filed by the parents of Javier Ramirez. He was a student leader at Cal Chelsea and a few other parents. They filed a court case against the school district. And it was a, a case presided by Renalo Gigarza, federal district court in Brownsville, <laughs> Texas. And that they alleged that, uh, that the student's right to free speech and to 
assemble peacefully during the walkout have been have been violated by the school district because the school you know the school principals they called the police they had arrested five of the student leaders and that's what led to the at Chelsea school case in November of 68 and at the end of the case it was the school district decided to settle out of court and the students were allowed to go back in without reprimand. Bob Sanchez, he was a local attorney that represented the students in the case. He, he wrote a letter that's saying that this case has been a tremendous victory for the fund, for Maldiv. Uh, the case has undoubtedly been a trailblazer for La Raza as heretofore our poor people had either read or been told about such things as a Bill of Rights. And for the most part, it thought that these things were mere history. Now they know that they're actually a reality and that their constitutional rights can be enforced today. And uh, and so that was, like I said, one of the important moments of the student movement. Uh, I know I've interviewed uh, at, uh, Faustino Arebia. Faustino Arebia, he was another important leader at Mayo who recalls uh, you know, the similar type of circumstances leading to the walkout. And so overall, my main arguments of my study, and I do plan to publish a book on my work, but my overall argument is that Chicano students throughout South Texas region long for public school reform through direct action protests that led to a greater awareness of educational issues as an important element of political and cultural struggle within the Chicano movement, and uh, that they desired for the school system to reflect their cultural heritage, and for the, school system, for the school system to ensure their academic progress for a better hope for the future, and for, uh, and for making positive contributions toward their school. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> and once again, we say that it's the students who were the driving force, the parents and the students. This is grassroots. Um, we do look forward to the publication, James. Uh, I do also notice that it was not just the hopes and aspirations of the students, but <clears throat> in every case that he's talking about, the students, he uses the word organizing. They didn't just hope and dream and want. They organized late in the night and uh, using uh, discipline, but organizing in order to achieve their objectives. Thank you, James. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Benjamin Marquez, um, is professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's director of the Chicana, Chicano, Latina, Latino Studies program there. He received his bachelor's at the uh, University of Texas, El Paso, and his master's and his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's the author of Democratizing Texas Politics, uh, University of Texas Press 2014. And, and if you haven't already gotten a copy or two of his book, you need to. Um, Buy two, two coffees. coffees. <laughs> two coffees. <laughs> they make great Christmas gifts. <laughs> <laughs> great Christmas. Christmas gift either as a gift or on the, on the coffee table. That's either right. way, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, today, uh, Dr. Marquez will be speaking about lawyers, foundations, and the Chicano movement building the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, MALDEF. Thank you very much. I am. Um, <clears throat> I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> um, uh, this, is my, this is my new project. Uh, I started it about a year and a half ago. Uh, and throughout my career, I've been interested in political organizations. And that's, what, uh, that's part of what attracted me uh, to the topic of MALDEF. Uh, and uh, and I've, I've been to various archives looking at materials related to the organization. So I've, I've, I'm getting off the ground. And this is actually the first time that I will present my, uh, some of my research findings uh, at, a, at a conference. Uh, and I guess uh, what I, I considered, uh, I don't have a working title for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, for the book yet, but I'm considering Trial by Fire, uh, because I think uh, Maldef 
uh, was uh, uh, came to birth uh, uh, through the uh, through the flames of the uh, of the Chicano movement. Uh, but this um, uh, MALDEF is an organization of cause lawyers, and I should mention that I'm using three different literatures to try to understand what MALDEF did and how it came to be what it is, and uh, and how it impacted the uh, community. <coughs> Uh, uh, which I think is an open question, uh, uh, but uh, uh, but MALDEF is an organization of cause lawyers, uh, and cause lawyers are attorneys who devote most of, or part of their professional lives to, or who are closely identified with social justice movements. I like that definition for this uh, uh, for uh, for MALDEF. Uh, it was first created to defend and expand the constitutional rights of Mexican Americans, and I think that's a, that's a useful definition here as well. And after its incorporation in 1968, uh, it entered the realm of, uh, the pretty exclusive realm of, uh, of minority political activism, occupied by a handful of other <coughs> similar legal organizations, like the NAACP LDF, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, uh, the Asian American Legal Defense Fund, and the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, and, uh, and others. So, uh, uh, so it's um, it's one of the things that I find interesting about the cause lawyer literature is that it looks at the way that lawyers act as independent political actors and the way that they impact social movements. Uh, much of the literature on social movements and minority politics looks at lawyers as appendages of those social movements. That uh, you know, you run into a situation and then you go out and you get a lawyer uh, to defend you. Uh, I think that this literature is turning our attention toward lawyers as political activists in their own rights who make their own decisions and who take actions uh, on, their, uh, uh, on their own. And I think this is important because typically, not always, uh, lawyers and social movements occupy different spheres of activities. Social movement organizations uh, uh, tend to utilize contentious tactics like marches, rallies, demonstrations, picketing, uh, civil disobedience, strikes, <coughs> school walkouts. Uh, these are things that, uh, that, that social movements do, and they engage in disruptive politics. Uh, uh, in contrast, lawyers operate within the confines of an institutionalized setting where constitutional rights, process, and legal precedent guide the outcome of a, uh, of a, given, uh, of a given dispute. Okay. And, uh, and cause lawyers can complement the work of community organizations, uh, but the legal realm is where attorneys have a disproportionate influence over the outcome by virtue of their technical knowledge, credentials, expertise, and role in the judicial system. Uh, I tell you, I've, I've read a lot of uh, materials on, on, on MALDEF, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I think I know a thing or two, but these documents are really hard to, uh, to comprehend. It's, it's the, uh, it's, it's the uh, arena of experts and professionals. Uh, now, the question here is, uh, that I'm posing by looking at the Chicano movement is, uh, is one that I'm asking you all as well. Uh, what creates social change? Uh, is it, is, does change create it through the courts, or is it, uh, is it done through disruptive, uh, disruptive activities? There's a lively debate uh, uh, going on, uh, going on uh, about that. Uh, so, so I do worry, uh, and the literature worries about the unequal relationship between lawyers uh, and uh, and social movements. And I, I developed that argument. I'm trying. I'm in the process of developing this argument. But I'm also interested in philanthropy and the impact that uh, philanthropy uh, from large uh, cor large uh, foundations like the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, and a whole host of others. But those are the big uh, the big three have had on the course of not just Mexican American but Latino Latino politics. Um, before I started this project, I. Uh, I, uh, if you were to ask me who is the most effective organizer uh, in Latino politics, I might have said, oh, someone like Cesar Chavez, maybe, uh, uh, someone like Ernesto Cortez, uh, someone like Jose Angel Gutierrez. Uh, but now I'm uh, starting to think perhaps it's the Ford Foundation. Uh, and uh, <laughs> they, they, they did a really good job of organizing in the Latina community. And, and I don't have all the time to get into all of the details of that, uh, but, I, uh, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm looking into that in, uh, in, in, in all the detail of what they did. Uh, in mid-20th century, the Ford Foundation took the lead in this. Uh, and they looked out on what was happening in American society, especially with the growing civil rights movement. And they worried a lot about that because they believed, unlike many other uh, uh, foundations, they believed that the disruption, the social unrest they saw growing uh, 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 in the uh, in the black community and then in the uh, in the Latino community with the Chicano movement and, and movements on the East Coast of Puerto Ricans were potentially dangerous. 
And they said that this is, some, this is a kind of disruption that is dangerous to the stability of American society. And in fact, many of, the, uh, uh, many of the, the works that have been written on Ford and other foundations like them is that they wanted to make America safe for American capitalism. But they looked, at, they looked at the American political and economic system as one that could potentially incorporate other peoples. Okay, that, this, uh, that the reason that there was so much unrest and so much disruption was because people of color were marginalized. And they especially looked at Latinos, and that they found Latinos especially worrisome uh, because, uh, uh, because they felt that they resembled other previous, uh, they, re they resembled uh, uh, white <laughs> ethnic groups of previous generations. They said, here is a group that has the potential for incorporation and assimilation into American society. They are helping African Americans as well, but they thought, here's one group that shouldn't be marginalized. Here's one group that, with a little help, can be incorporated successfully uh, into, uh, into uh, American society. Uh, now, uh, uh, I, um, I, I, um, I, I, I think that, um, that this was a, uh, this was a, a tough uh, thing to, uh, uh, to achieve because racial hierarchies come about for a reason, I believe. I believe the history of the Mexican-American people is the history of labor, and it's a history of the, of, the, of the importation of large, disorganized labor into the United States basically to, uh, uh, to have them work. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very tough thing that they set out to do. And I like the work of, uh, of Alice O'Connor when she posed this question, what would they try to accomplish and, and why. And, and here's what she says, I'll, I'll read from, uh, 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 from her work. She says that the, that the Ford Foundation uh, engaged in a larger historical project that was deeply conflicted, if not contradictory, at its core. Uh, the project of continually reinventing 20th century liberalism, at once a program of broad-based social and economic and social and cultural reform, but also an embodiment of more limited ideological, institutional, political, and cultural con consensus that especially as the Cold War against communism reached its height, uh, was defined around a shared commitment to capitalism, political democracy, cultural pluralism, and a mildly redistributive state. Um, it was a product that was both motivated and eliminated in foundations and their engagement with civil rights and social justice movements, while putting leading foundations at odds with more radical confrontation and direct aspects of movement politics, which was a lot of the uh, Chicano movement uh, uh, as, I, as, I read, as I read its, uh, its history. Uh, so, uh, so I found the way that, uh, I, I, find it, I find it very interesting, uh, the way that, um, uh, the, way that, that uh, the Ford Foundation entered uh, uh, into the uh, into the area of Latino politics because they built MALDA from the ground up. Uh, when the Ford Foundation began funding uh, the NAACP LDF, it was already an ongoing organization. But they liked what they saw. In the case of MALDA, it um, and it's okay. I'll tell a brief story about Jack Greenberg, who was running the litigation program for the NAACP. Uh, in uh, in his mem in his papers, he said that one day he was in his office and he got a call. Uh, from the Ford Foundation, and it was from a Ford Foundation official. He said, I didn't know him, he didn't know me, but he wanted us, he wanted us to sit down and talk about funding, about, about moving Ford money into, uh, into the LDF. Jack, this activity put Jack Greenberg eventually in touch with Mexican-American lawyers in the Southwest. Uh, and, uh, and, and Vilma Martinez, I believe, worked with, uh, with Jack Greenberg uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the LDF. Uh, but, uh, but he was in touch with others, uh, primarily Pete Tijerina, who was the primary organizer of, uh, of MALDEF, and he one day told them, uh, you, should have a, uh, you should have an organization of your own. Uh, he told that to three people he brought to New York, and the response was, uh, how, how do you do that? Uh, and uh, the Ford Foundation told them how to do that, uh, and, and actually in, in, uh, in, uh, in, great, uh, in great detail. Uh, so the Ford Foundation was very clear, and, and I, I say the Ford Foundation a lot because the Ford Foundation was the beacon uh, that brought along, eventually brought along the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, and a lot of other foundations. There, the, all, of the, all the foundation officials are on a first name basis. I mean, they, they know each other, they, they, they talk to one another, and they all wait to see, the smaller foundations wait to see what Ford uh, is going to do. Uh, and once Ford moved into the arena, uh, not right away, but later, uh, the, others, uh, the others came around uh, as well. Uh, so it was uh, the Ford Foundation, I, I found, um, 
uh, was actually very clear. I found a lot of documents about, about what, they intended, uh, what they intended to do. Uh, and one of the things that they wanted uh, was to expand rights for Mexican Americans, to find, uh, to find lawyers that would aggressively pursue rights in the courts, uh, but they also wanted to demonstrate uh, uh, that Latino grievances could be resolved in the courts rather than in the streets. So again, you know, really, what creates change? You know, what creates effective change? Is it in the courts or is it in the streets? Uh, uh, sometimes they come together, uh, most of the time uh, uh, it's not. Uh, and what they worried the most about was that uh, Latinos and Mexican Americans in particular might conclude that American society was incorrigibly racist. Uh, so it was, uh, it was motivated by Chicano movement politics, but the, the, the rising unrest uh, in, uh, in American society because they, Ford Foundation officials prized harmony and they disdained any form of political extremism, including any form of, uh, of communism or de demag dem demagoguery, these are their words, uh, and the, quote, <laughs> dangerous irrationality of the masses and the disruptive social conflict inherent in mass, in mass politics. Uh, so with millions to spend, uh, one, uh, the Ford Foundation supported initiatives in participation and public affairs, like citizenship and naturalization, leadership development, research and policy analyses, public education, advocacy, litigation, and economic uh, self-sufficiency. And it left a lasting imprint on Latino politics by, uh, by funding groups like, uh, like Maldiv, of course, uh, but the National Council of La Raza, the Spanish-speaking Unity Council, the Mexican-American Unity Council, and then later they cut them off, uh, Chicanos por la Causa, the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project, the Midwest Voter Registration Education Progress Project, and the National Puerto Rican Voter Participation Project, and later, and later uh, PRALDEF, uh, the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund. Uh, it, uh, and, the, and the whole list of, uh, of other organizations. Uh, so between 1969 and 1979, the Ford Foundation poured over $24 million into building what was labeled as public interest law. So it took a, it took a, very, big, uh, a very big part in this. Now, the problem is, of course, that um, this was the 1960s. And there were a lot of organizations and a lot of individuals that looked to MALDEF for help. Uh, and uh, and not only the name, uh, Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, uh, but its outreach uh, to community organizations sent the message that we are here uh, to protect you. Uh, but the question is how? Uh, when organizations wanted help, uh, they wanted help with everything from immigration problems, unlawful arrests, welfare and sec social security issues, urban renewal, civil service employees' grievances, denier of voter rights, which they've done, and, uh, and police violence which I'll talk about in a little more detail in just a second. Uh, and Maldef heeded the call. Maldef actually jumped into a lot of these cases, uh, which, uh, which, uh, 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 which would be unsustainable because, uh, uh, because P.T. Harina reported that his office uh, in its first year of op second year of operation alone, it received almost 4,000 calls for help, 4,000 calls and requests uh, for, uh, for legal aid. So the, the community said, great, you're here, uh, help me. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> they, they started to try and do that. Uh, Piti Hidina represented La Raza Unida Party activists uh, for MALDEF. Uh, it established in court that the plaintiffs had a right to run for public office and support candidates for public office without this, the discriminatory burden of property ownership. This is this was huge. Uh, it represented land, rent, land and water rights activists in northern New Mexico. Yes, it worked with Reyes Lopez Tijerina. It, uh, it worked with farm workers in South Texas, the Crusade for Justice in Colorado. Uh, 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 any veteranos in here will readily recognize will readily recognize these names. They did that, uh, uh, but it was uh, it was they were they were proud to do that. Uh, uh, but I think I at this point my understanding is that they were they were of uh, they were of uh, of two minds uh, that uh, and uh, and the Ford Foundation certainly was not. Uh, this type of legal aid could not be sustained, and it pulled the organization away from its major mission, which was to uh, was as a legal reform organization. It was to create legal reform and institutional change. So you just can't go out and, and help everybody that uh, that walks that walks through the door. Uh, so. I think the police brutality uh, uh, issue is, uh, is, is instructive in this case. And as I look at the police brutality files uh, uh, in, the, uh, 
uh, in the Maldef uh, archives and in the archives here uh, for, uh, at, the, uh, at the Benson. Uh, I'm just amazed at how you can take the police brutality cases that took place during the 60s and 70s and translate them almost word for word to the present period. Uh, it's, it's really, really tough uh, to control a police force that's exerting uh, uh, violence against, uh, uh, against the community. Uh, but this was something that really shocked uh, the community, and it shocked the, uh, the sensibility of many, uh, of many Maldiv, uh, Maldiv, uh, um, um, uh, Maldiv uh, uh, lawyers. But there were huge obstacles to, pers to pursuing police brutality requests. Uh, you know, you see all these videos on TV and you think, wow, it's obvious they're going to get these guys. But no, they get away with murder right on television. Uh, uh, these, yeah. they, they engaged with this at the very beginning. Um, uh, the, uh, to begin with, police br brutality cases are labor-intensive, time-consuming affairs. Uh, each one certainly requires two trials, a criminal defense trial and a subsequent trial for uh, 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 a civil case for damages. They were difficult to uh, settle. Uh, in each case, the, uh, uh, the facts tend to be complex and always in dispute. And I found that one Maldiv case involved 15 depositions. Maybe that's not uncommon, but that's a, that's a huge energy, energy sink for, for a group with limited, uh, with limited resources. And then finally, uh, um, Mario Obledo observed that, that if they succeeded with any of these cases, it would lead to even more requests. Uh, it, would, uh, it, would, it would result in an immense number of cases, uh, given the bad relations between the, uh, uh, between the community uh, and, the, uh, and the police. Uh, but it really was the Ford Foundation that, uh, uh, that, uh, that took note of this and brought the problems uh, to, the, um, uh, to the attention of the lawyers. Uh, um, <coughs> this was a uh, um, Ford Foundation officials and their consultants uh, the, uh, uh, had a look at what Maldiv was doing. This, so it was undergoing constant review by the foundations that, uh, that fund them. And, um, and one review <coughs> said that police litigation, uh, police litigation was signaled out by one review as the paradigm of insignificant cases. I mean, that, 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 that phrase just sort of leaped off the page at me. Whoa, what do you mean it's insignificant? It's not if you just got beat up by the cops. Uh, but it meant, that, uh, it meant that it was not pushing forward uh, uh, the envelope of, uh, of legal reform. Uh, one reviewer said this, uh, uh, it's hard to believe that any single police brutality case would be of more long-run benefit to the Chicano community than a suit challenging mental retardation testing, uh, you know, you talked about some of that, uh, employment discrimination by government bodies, or the right to an equal educational opportunity. So they wanted to, you know, this is, this is where the real change uh, occurs, but, uh, but that meant that you had to break away and you had to resist all the requests that were made of you from the various organizations that, uh, that existed, uh, existed at the time. Uh, and uh, within six years of its, uh, of its, uh, of its formation, Malda stopped accepting police brutality cases, except those that represented a widespread pattern of abuse and, uh, and practices. So, you know, you got it, it's, it's, they'll refer you to someone else and, mm -hmm. and, and good luck. And, uh, but it's been, uh, it's been a long time. But uh, 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 this was something that Pete, even Piti Harina himself realized that the organization was about, that it just couldn't be absorbing all these, uh, all these, these, these individual claims. So uh, I found that, you know, even as late as 1975, uh, 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 Maldives General Counsel uh, Vilma Martinez was still having to explain to community activists and organizations why Maldives cannot handle all the cases in which it is asked to intervene. So hence, they have to make choices, just like everyone else. You have, you have to make choices. And, uh, and Maldives is, I think, a very, uh, a, very um, um, a very powerful organization, and that's a, uh, uh, that's a, um, uh, that's an important one. There was there was there was internal dissent, and this is part of the uh, the story that I'm that I'm working on now. Um, uh, I, when I when I talked about this at yesterday's uh, yesterday's workout, workshop, uh, I was I was gratified to to hear that people knew who Oscar Zeta Acosta was, uh, and he uh, and he worked for a short while with uh, with Malda. And he was a, he was a dissenter, uh, and uh, and he's, he he wrote a number of letters uh, to Pete Tejerina, saying things like, uh, you know, he was at a loss as to why Maldiv would not defend quote young Chicano activists who are fighting the, for the rights uh, of our uh, of our people. So the organization did come under uh, did come under uh, 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 fire for the for the actions that it took, and it displayed uh, a, a tremendous amount of uh, of independence uh, from those that placed uh, that placed pressure on it. 
Now, another thing that I look at in my examination of philanthropy and, uh, and politics uh, is the way that, uh, that funding, outside funding solves the collection, collective action dilemma. Okay, so, uh, so how do you get people to act in a collective manner? Well, that, it's, it's a very difficult process. Outside funding solves that issue. It goes away because you, you just have to convince uh, those that, uh, that provide your revenue stream. Uh, and they guide the organization uh, uh, in negotiation with, uh, with, the, uh, with the leaders of the, of the, of the group, uh, but, uh, but they are the ones who fund, and it's a, um, uh, it's a, very, difficult, uh, it's a very difficult thing to say uh, no to your, uh, uh, to your funders. Uh, so, but it, it, did, it, did, uh, it did elevate a voice. It gave it enduring, uh, uh, enduring staying power. And all of the groups that you read about in the 1960s, they're all gone. Uh, but uh, but Maldiv uh, is still here doing, doing very good work, but, uh, but it did elevate one voice, one, one approach to social change uh, over, over the other, uh, not that it repressed these other groups, but it, uh, but it, gave, them, it gave them the kind of staying power that, uh, that, other, groups, uh, that other groups did not. Uh, so I am, um, there's, there's just an awful lot here, uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm, still, I'm still working on it, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, you know, once again end with, uh, well, you know, what, uh, you know, what is it that uh, that creates uh, that creates change, and uh, and I began reading work on, uh, you know, critical work on the courts, and uh, and after I looked at how long some of these cases take, I mean, some of these these cases take decades to resolve. And uh, and sometimes the uh, the facts on the ground change, especially in desegregation cases. You know, when it takes so so long, you know, housing patterns, living patterns, schooling patterns, uh, all change, often rendering uh, the original issue uh, uh, issue moot. Okay, I, okay, I, I know that word. Uh, but uh, but I I, I, uh, I like I like some of the the the. the uh, the scholars in this area who call our attention to the difficulties of creating change in the courts. And I wanted to end by reading a quote uh, from Rosenberg, who famously argued that reform through the courts is constrained in significant ways. Uh, and first, litigants must convince courts that the rights they are asserting are required by constitutional or statutory language. Given the limited nature of constitutional rights, the constraints of the legal culture, and the general caution of the judiciary, this is no easy task. Uh, second, courts are wary of stepping too far out of the political mainstream. Deferential to the federal government and potentially limited by congressional action, courts may be unwilling to take the heat generated by politically unpopular rulings. And third, if these two constraints are overcome and cases are decided favorably, litigants are then faced with the task of implementing decisions. Okay, so this is a, a you know, no social movement organizing is ever easy, it never happens quickly, uh, uh, but, uh, but these are some of the problems incurred, incur, incurred, uh, incurred in the courts. And I think one of the things that needs to be done uh, uh, is, is to do more work on MELDA, because one of the, what I struggled with is just the limited literature on the organization. There's only yeah. been two or three things written on the group at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, Maritza and I were talking about uh, the need for an analysis of its legal accomplishments over time. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what were the results? You know, we, boy, I saw Maldef going into all these little towns in Texas and California and just, you know, dismantling the, um, uh, at large elections, making them more yeah. representative. Uh, uh, we need, we need a, an analysis of that. But, you know, <coughs> again, I'll leave with the question, you know, what, what do you think? creates change. And I think that's the mark of a good paper. Um, on one hand, you want to hear him talk more. I mean, I, I, I just don't want the end of this paper. I want more facts. And because it's so constructive, it's so factual, you, you just don't want him to stop talking. On the other hand, as much as he gives you, he's creating and stimulating more questions. Uh, what is the role of MALDEF? Um, you see opposing imperatives, the Ford Foundation wanting to preserve, stabilize the institution uh, of government in America. On the other hand, it's funding the very social disruptive change that, that may be threatening that. And so is it, as a result, is MALDEF then is Maldef preserving the institutional stability? Mm -hmm. Or is Maldef playing the role of the, the professional activist to, to promote social change? 
Uh, those are the questions that he raises. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. Um, I'd like to know what you all think of the, of the questions that they've raised, the facts that they've given us. We have uh, 10 minutes. We intentionally did this. Uh, they, each of them, disciplined themselves. And I gotta tell you, I've never had a panel like this that right to the minute they stopped at exactly <laughs> when we said. So they gave you the time. And um, what better person to start uh, addressing this issue of the, the professional activist than Al Kaufman. Uh, Al, uh, you tell us what you, what you heard, sir, what you think. I couldn't help myself. Uh, first of all, on the historical figures around here, you're, you're certainly right. And uh, Richard Avena is here, and he organized the, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Hearings in 1968. Oh, cool. worked on all the series on Mexican-American education. And like Richard Avena. Richard Avena. From San Antonio. Okay. So you got some real historical characters. You mentioned the uh, Bastrop. There he is. Oh, there you go. You mentioned the Bastrop case. And, yeah. Uh, Gonzalo Barrientos, his family is one of the plaintiffs in that case. Gonzalo. Delgado versus Bastrop. Yes. ISD. Yeah. And of course you have, you have Velma here. And, uh, yes. She actually hired me at Malden in 74, so we go way back. Uh, I do want to talk about the Malden thing a little bit. Uh, no doubt about the, the constructive tension, I guess, between the, uh, the Ford Foundation and Malden, no doubt. And, and Maggie Rivas is here. I'm sure you read her piece about the formation of Malden and Mexican Americans involved. But just remember that all those uh, disparities were within the Mexican American movement before they even heard of the Ford Foundation. I mean, there was. Dr. Hector Garcia on one side and Luciana Gutierrez on the other. I met them both the same week. Um, so there was a lot of tension in the community. I mean, they, there were people who wanted to do systemic change. There were others who wanted direct mm -hmm. action change. Mm -hmm. So even before the Ford Foundation came in, that was mm -hmm. there. To some extent, I think it was a marriage of convenience. And there were people, activists, who wanted to do something like the Legal Defense Fund and then Ford Foundation came in and helped a great deal, no doubt about that. But there, I think there was even, that movement was even there before. Uh, but they found a source, and, and the Ford Foundation found some good people to do it, so they found each other. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, for those of you who don't know, you know, Malden was founded in San Antonio. Uh, right. And you got to come to San Antonio and work on this. Within five years, San Antonio created the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, the Southwest Voter Registration Project, the Mexican American Cultural Center. Uh, later on, the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, uh, Scene Network, uh, Casa Oeri, all in San Antonio, within about 10 blocks of each other. Plus two Mexican revolutions are planned yeah. there, too. So he went to the Kansas City, got to go to So there's a lot of history walking around. I'm glad Richard's here. Be sure to see him before you go. And Gonzalo, I'm glad to talk to you. Oh, where's Gonzalo? No question about it. Your, um, the names that are coming out here, uh, Gus Garcia, um, Bob Sanchez, uh, Piti Harina. Uh, and, and, and those, you know, those are the pillars. Uh, and the people who, who you just cannot go without mentioning. I've got a question here. Hi, Carmen. I'm a Christian Spirit Professor Madera. Thank you for your presentation. So I grew up 30 minutes north of San Antonio in San Marcos, Texas. And I went to high school, I would say probably about 30 years after the walkouts. And everything you described pretty much describes what I saw oh. in high school, right? So I saw kids being tracked to the shop classes. I took um, home ec my senior year because it was the only class available at an empty spot. And it really impacted me because I saw what was kind of like a throwaway class, right? There was no I learned to sew. It totally not throwaway. Oh, no, they didn't learn to sew. Oh, they learned to sew. But exactly, I, I met other kids that took home ec when I went to college. They learned to sew. They learned to pull up. They learned to balance the checkbook. We literally didn't do anything. That's what I mean by throwaway class. No, there was that. literally no we did not stow. We didn't have anything. And so, again, this 30 years after, kind of the same platform as the, the same um, issue these kids had. I'd love to hear what's happening today. I haven't lived in Texas in a few years, so I don't know what I'm facing now, but I'd love to hear what are the similarities they're faced. I hope there's been some advances, if you could share some of that, and also look from the audience. Right, you're talking about contemporary? Because uh, that's uh, what I'm still, of course, looking up and researching, but what I 
can tell you though is that, for example, at the uh, Edgewood High School, after their protest, we had over 400 that walked out, and it was in the next semester. And I, of course, I've done interviews on this. On uh, I was uh, Dana Bersenio, and there was also uh, Richard Herrera that had told me that in the next semester after the walkout, they saw the changes. Like, wow, the the gym floor has been refurbished, and we have new textbooks, and the school has <laughs> been painted. So. <laughs> after 30 years. And um, mm, new textbooks. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I was able to find out from them, you know, from the former students at that school in Edgewood that there had been improvements, you know, as far as, uh, as a facility and that there was uh, more availability of college preparatory courses, but still there was a concern, like you were saying, right, that there were still some students that were not being offered the opportunity to take college prep courses. And uh, uh, another of course, case study at Cal Chelsea, it was uh, by the early 1970s when they did hire the first Mexican-American counselor, they were able to uh, also elect more school board members at Cal Chelsea. They added a Title I migrant counselor, athletic director, curriculum director, uh, attendance secretary, community aides. There was more hiring. Of, of Latinos, Mexican Americans in public schools, and uh, and it wasn't just within the schools as far as the staff, the faculty, administration, but within within the community itself, there was more awareness of you know the you know opportunity to vote and to turn out to vote and to elect more Latinos and student and the not just student council but city council and county elections, but. Uh, but I'm not just surprised to hear what you're saying, you know, that, that there are still school districts that still have not, you know, really have not changed that much since the 60s. There's still those same issues, those same concerns. And, uh, and it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly why this is still happening. But uh, I would have to say that it depends on the leadership of the school and the willingness of uh, teachers, <clears throat> you know, to be able to reach out to students and, and to be able to offer the curriculum because, uh, because what I also could tell was that there's the issue of finances, you know, with, with these schools that they're in neighborhoods, they're predominantly low income, you know, and that, that was uh, still a concern because you know, it does affect the availability of resources, how they're able to receive resources and how they're able to upgrade and, and to implement new programs. And so, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's sad to hear about this. That it's still ongoing and there's still a need for more uh, changes in the curriculum and the school systems. And there's no question that uh, while milestone uh, accomplishments have been made, um, that it works at cross currents with this constant uh, pressure to go right back to the old days of segregation. Segregation is something that schools are trying to do today, all over Texas, still, yeah. all over the country. And so it's just they're working at cross currents and it's just a constant dynamic process. We had a question back here. Uh, Ankana. Yeah, so on this panel on social change, I think what's a little uncanny is that um, on uh, November, what was it, on the 6th, Chancellor McRaven for the UT system issues this uh, statement, oh, yeah. statement that we need to diversify the faculty, that throughout the UT system, Hispanics and African Americans are underrepresented and mm -hmm. basically calling for affirmative action. But two days later, then we hear about the resignation of, I think it was the eighth, of uh, the president, the chancellor from the University of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And then we hear about the student walkouts in Yale. <clears throat> Something is happening. I mean, I think that, you know, so I'm really curious about, you know, what people in the room think. I, about I these movements. So it's not only who, who does the change, but what's going on. Vilma Martinez. I have a comment to that. Yeah. I think to answer Professor Mathis's question, what causes social change, which is sports or disruptive activities? It isn't an either or, it's both. It's both and. When you think of the Bronze Board of Board of Education, Tyler Rideau, those sports decisions cause social change. 
But so does disruptive activity, where the mm-hmm. disruptive activity mm-hmm. comes from the police inappropriate brutal action, or from the actions, for example, at the University of Missouri mm-hmm. of the athletic players, the football players who refused to play on the team, the African Americans refused to play on the team until the chancellor resigned, the president resigned. So, you know, the disruptive activities from mm-hmm. both sides of the aisle here, this is just social activists engaging in disruptive activity. There's disruptive activity of, of all kinds that, mm-hmm. that must be answered. Mm-hmm. Which I think uh, makes a couple of points. One of them is that um, Uh, Like in the American Revolution, uh, it's important to have people like uh, Washington and John Adams and the the old lawyers and those guys. But without the crowd action, uh, without the disruptive action, there there would not have been an American Revolution. And and so on one hand, you need the, the disruptive change. On the other hand, it is what makes it such an American process. Uh, We're not aliens. This is America, and that's the way America moves forward. One last question. We've got a, about one minute left. Yes, ma'am. I, I don't have a question. I just want to add something. Um, I was always embarrassed because Corpus Christi didn't have a walkout. Okay. Um, well, I mean, by the time I found out about him, it was already over. But, uh, but uh, the other thing is that one thing that doesn't seem to be in the theme of anything, and that's why I think I'm going to go to graduate school, is organized labor's involvement in this. Uh, I grew up in Corpus, which was mm-hmm. heavily uh, World War II influenced as far mm-hmm. as the Latino uh, leadership. The guys came back from World War II and they were still mm-hmm. being discriminated against, so they, mm-hmm. they formed uh, Jeff Form. And then the other thing that they formed uh, with other Latino groups, including Jeff Form, was LULAC. Because um, that's where Men's Council, Men's Council, number one, comes from, who gave me college money or would have come to the school. Uh, yet, of course, I fought about the men's council, right? But anyway, um, there were walkouts, but they weren't so significant that they got on television, okay? Um, because we did all our work, the, and at least in my neighborhood, because it was heavily union organized, heavily. Every street had at least 20 homes that had a union member in them. Um, we did our activities through the union. For instance, uh, I went to Moody High School. Moody High School was the first school that was built on the west side, which in, in Corpus, that's where the uh, mid, lower middle class Mexicanos are, um, and there's also an African American community there, or was when I was young. Um, if something didn't work in the school district, my dad took it to the union. The union then uh, voted on something to get money, and then they would take it to the parents who were the PTA presidents, and then we'd change things. A quick example, when I went to Moody High School, it was, considered a um, trades-related high school. You were gonna get to learn to be uh, LVN, um, cosmetologist, mm-hmm. um, child care worker, uh, I think there was one other thing, I can't remember what the fourth thing was. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you could be a body man, or mechanics, or a carpenter, or you know, the, the list mm-hmm. for the guys was much longer, which I thought discriminated anyway, because I wanted to be in that instead of the others. When I said to my counselor, I don't wanna do those things. I want to go to college. My dad said that he did what he did for me to go to college, so where's the college preparatory classes? There were none, okay? And, and in fact, the counselor said, your scores will not get you to college. Well, I was president of everything, so I didn't have time to study. I was leading everybody. So I said, no, I'm gonna to go to college, so you have to have classes. So I went to my dad, my dad went to his union, the union went to the PTA president, which was me, by the way, because it was PTSO. And we got together, and we then presented to the PTSO parents, and we then went to the school board, but it was because of the union mm-hmm. putting in their money. We went to the school board, and guess what? We got a program. 10% of us got to participate in this program. There were no honor classes, mm-hmm. and in fact, if you wanted to have third or fourth year of something, you had to go outside of Moody. Well, that meant somebody had to pick you up, take you there, bring you back. Well, we went back to the school board, and eight of us had a trig calculus class, eight. And we did not have to leave the campus. Uh, but it was because of the union activity in our community. Uh, that's why I actually want to go back to graduate school, because I want to write a paper on the involvement of organized labor in a community like Corpus and where it led it. 
Today, it's not quite the same as it was when I was growing up. It's not quite as organized. But the foundation of it had to do with union members. And I went to work for a union. I uh, retired from working for a union. I married a union man. Uh, my grandfather and my father were union. And they knew the value of the vote. The unions did. So they put money into political campaigns, primarily Democratic campaigns. And I think I worked 30 years basically paid to do that. So that's another area that we, I don't see anybody touching, and I would like to hear, you know, other people than me who has been active all my life of what organized labor did to influence, the, not only influence the vote, but the Chicano movement, everything. Cause we well, in, in a sense, time. they played the role probably that, that uh, Ben was saying the Ford Foundation was. I want to thank all of you. And by the way, I, I'm as big a disappointment to my school that I, I, I got a PhD. I didn't become a barber. Know, they sad? wanted me they to be a barber. To so uh, thank you all. I think we accomplished our purpose. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah.